Assalamu alaikum, good evening, and welcome to IBN. You are live with C Results, and you are also live for those of you on Facebook joining us with our C Results page. I'm Naila, and I will be taking you through our creative writing session today. So, as you know, we started and we have completed quite a couple of sessions actually, and we discussed a number of topics put in into the SEA component, the creative writing SEA component, right? So, so far, what we looked at, we started off with types of sentences. So we discussed the four types of sentences, um, which I'm just gonna quickly state because we have already discussed all of this. All of this. So if you missed it, you still have the opportunity to go on Facebook on our C results page and look for the videos and replay those videos, okay? Taking notes and whatever else you may need to help you get ready for SEA creative writing. You know, creative writing can either be narrative or expository. So we are starting with the narrative aspect. So we started with types of sentences. We had our declarative sentence, interrogative, imperative, and exclamatory. All of those were already discussed as mentioned before. We also analyzed a paragraph. So we looked at a couple paragraphs where we identified the main idea, the supporting details, and the concluding sentence, as well as we looked at how you can avoid irrelevant details when writing a paragraph. So that was quite an interesting session. Also, we had a number of submissions on the Edmodo app where we asked students to write a paragraph using the main idea, supporting details, and concluding sentence. So that was your assessment, basically. You had to write a paragraph, including all of those things needed in a paragraph. And we had a great number of submissions so far and some interesting reads. So next week, for sure, we are gonna show we're going to broadcast some of those pieces with your permission of course and we're going to show our viewers what great submissions we have and we're going to show some ways you can probably improve in one or two areas so we are going to do that for you there so look out for your names so we also did sentence structures in sentence structures which was last day we spoke about different types of sentences. So we had simple sentence, we had a compound and a complex sentence. So in writing the compound and complex sentence, we noted that in your compound sentence, you must have two or more independent clauses and they are joined by using your coordinating junction, conjunctions, and we also learned an acronym for that. And for complex sentences, we know that they are joined by subordinating conjunctions when they include a dependence and an independent clause. Now that is very important and key when you are writing to bring variety to your essay, to your piece, okay? You need a variety of sentences to make your reader interested, to captivate their attention, to really hook hook them, you want them to keep reading and be interested by what, you, what they are reading. And in addition, we started extending or expanding sentences by adding adjectives and adverbs. So what we basically want to do, we want to learn the best way you can make your sentences more interesting. And those are some of the ways that we came across so far. So we're talking about conjunctions, adverbs, adjectives, all of those things to make sentences or to join sentences rather. So if you missed last session, here's what we did. So just like a recap, we use the five W's and the H to come up with ways to help us extend our sentence. Now this is no particular rule. You do not have to follow it step by step or even question word by question word, but what you, it will help you as a guide, it acts as a guide. So let's look at this example here and you'll see what I mean when I say use the five W's and H to help you expand your sentence. So who, the vehicle stopped. It's not really a who there, but it's a what. What kind of vehicle? So now you wanna make that sentence interesting. You had that simple sentence there, but you find that, you know, it's too short. I wanna fill up this entire line. I want to extend this, this sentence. I wanna fill up, you know, complete this paragraph, make it really interesting. So now you can say the vehicle stopped. To add to that, you can say the ancient vehicle stopped, right? So we're talking about ancient vehicle there, okay. Right, the ancient vehicle stopped. So how? The ancient vehicle stopped abruptly, right? So it stopped suddenly. So now you're discussing how the vehicle stopped. So all of a sudden you're driving and then you know you stop. 
The reason we are inserting you know, adjectives and adverbs and so on in our sentence is to make that sentence more interesting, is to add detail to it, right? Hence, extending the sentence. Here for you, instead of using the word ancient again, I give you a choice. So if you want to go with ancient, or even if you wanted to use rickety old, which I will show you shortly, you can use both of them, whichever you choose, right? I just want to show you a variety of words here. So where? The ancient vehicle stopped abruptly in the middle of the creepy town. Now look at that sentence there. You went from the vehicle stopped, and now you are at the ancient vehicle stopped abruptly in the middle of the creepy town. But you want to continue that sentence some more. You want to expand on it. Now you have some more ideas. As you are writing, you are remembering probably something that you saw, a movie that you saw, or a book that you read. And some of those details are coming back to you. And you can add that in your writing. Nothing is wrong with that. So the more you read, is the more knowledge you gain, the more vocabulary you gain, and the more you have to write. Also, experience plays a great role in that. So parents, if you are you know, taking your children out, probably to the beach or to the zoo or a camping experience, engage in conversation with them. Let them talk about what they are seeing, what they are hearing, you know, describe the setting, describe the people who are there. Maybe you came, up, came across somebody really strange or somebody really friendly. Let them describe those persons or person to you. Help them engage in building their vocabulary. That will also help them you know, expressing ideas and bringing about experience in their own writing. You know, it will benefit them in that way. So let's move on. When? Now we're going to talk about when this happened. You know, you're going to add a day or a date. Last Sunday, the rickety old vehicle stopped abruptly in the middle of the creepy town. So before notice, we had ancient vehicle. If you wanted to change it with ancient and instead you want to use rickety old, it's up to you, right? So last Sunday, the rickety old vehicle stopped abruptly in the middle of the creepy town. And why? Last Sunday, the rickety old vehicle stopped abruptly in the middle of the creepy town as the engine suddenly stalled. So look at how your sentence has evolved. Look at that. Very simple sentence here. You moved on, you kept on building. Ideas keep coming to you. So much so that you end up with, with a sentence such as this. Last Sunday, the rickety old vehicle stopped abruptly in the middle of the creepy town as the engine suddenly stalled. This sentence that you are seeing here can be even used as your hook. It can be your very first sentence in your, in your narrative piece. Immediately, when the person or persons reading that sentence, they're going to be interested. They're going to be captured by that. Now they are studying or thinking, it's painting a picture in their mind. Now what is really going on here? You, are, you become curious. There's mystery added to your story. And that is precisely what you want to do. You want to build mystery and you want your readers to stay connected and stay on, on task with what they are reading. You don't want them to be bored. Even for you, if you are reading a book, don't you want to be excited by what you are reading? Don't you want to find out what is going to happen next? And that is the same thing we want to do there. We want to create that mystery. We want them leaving the reader wanting more. So, right. So what I have behind me here, we have some verbs and nouns. And what we are going to do with them, we are going to transform or to make them into an adjective. Now. This here is something that we did in ELA as well as in creative writing. And now you will find that a lot of these topics are very closely tied with um, the grammar and the actual creative writing. You need to know what to do the next, right? It works hand in hand, it's very closely linked. So last day when we spoke about when we spoke about adverbs and adjectives, this is what we want you to do with them. We want you to use it in your writing to make it more interesting. So here I have behind me just a couple sentences, and now we are going to take the words in brackets, either the noun or verb, and we're going to make it into an adjective. So it's an adjective ex exercise. So we're going to use them to make our sentences more interesting. So we could probably open up the phone lines there, and I'm going to demonstrate for you one. So look at number one there. Nicholas ate some something candy, and you have the verb taste in brackets. I want to make this into an adjective. What will I do? How will I make this into an adjective, right? If you're writing a sentence in your book, will you say Nicholas ate some taste candy? No, you won't. You have to know 
that this word becomes tasty, tasty candy. So notice how we took that verb and it was made into an adjective. So you can take verbs, nouns, and change them to adjectives or adverbs, whatever the context of your story or writing is. Look at number two. You need to be, and you have strength in bracket. Which adjective comes from the noun strength? And if you had in your mind, strong, you are correct. All right, moving on to number three. Who left these something sucks in the bedroom? I have smell. Who like, who enjoys, who enjoys the smell of smelly socks? Nobody really, right? So it becomes smelly. So maybe you have an older sibling who enjoys making you smell those socks. I don't know. Number four. The garden is full of something, flowers. What type of flowers? How can we describe these flowers? Great, we have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller, and welcome. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. What's your name? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum What's your name? Um, Javed. Hi, Javed. So we're looking at number four. We have a noun in bracket there, which is beauty. I want you to use that noun and create an adjective from that noun. Okay. What do you think it's going to be? Beautiful. Very good. Right? Thank you so much for calling and giving us that answer. So now it becomes beautiful. The garden is full of beautiful flowers. Number five. It was such a something experience. And I have satisfied the verb satisfy there. How can I make that into an adjective? Right? How can I use that in a sentence? You have to know which form of the verb or now to use when you are writing. So this is part of it here. Good evening, Kola, welcome. Good evening, Kola, welcome to see results. Hi, good evening. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Khadija. Hi, Khadija. So are you gonna give us the answer for number five? So are you gonna give us the answer for number five? Yes. Okay, what's it gonna be? Spell it for me. S A T I S F Y I N G. Excellent job. So, thank you so much for calling. So, you should note when there is a spelling change, as in the case of tasty here, or when there's where the verb remains the same and you add ing. All of those are rules that we already covered in our ELA aspect of the SEA component. Okay. So, please. Try to try not to miss a single episode. We are in crunch time. It's really important that we get all the information here and we use that information. We apply that information that we have learned. This isn't just about sitting and watching. You actually have to take that knowledge and apply it. And I promise you, you are going to see results. Good. So just before this, we had a few sentences with adjectives. Now we also said we need to use adverbs in our writing. So here I have with me, or right behind me, I have a short excerpt, right? This is not the entire paragraph here, just a couple lines. You in brackets, I have a couple adverbs. You have to choose the most appropriate adverb in context with this excerpt here. So both of them might look you know that it might look like it might be correct, but you have to know which one is really suited here. First, we are going to read it, and then we can probably choose the appropriate adverb. So you need to read the entire passage or entire piece here, and then we can start working. Remember, it is always important that you look at your information closely before you start working, before you jump right into it. It was a beautiful day with the sun shining, carefully or brightly. How does the sun shine? Is it carefully or is it brightly? I slowly or excitedly phoned my friends, asking them to come for a picnic. So if it's a day like this, you know, it's, it's a beautiful day, you're all excited, you're all cheery, how, how will you call your friends? Will you take your time and move on and call them? Or will you move on to your phone really quickly, all in a hurry, and make that call? Think about it. I gently or happily drove into the town to buy some food and drink. So if, imagine now, you are older, you can drive. You are so excited by this whatever little garden you're going to have or a little picnic. How will you be driving? Will you gently drive or will you happily drive? 
When I got to town, I was luckily or very surprised at how busy it was. So here, look closely, we have luckily and very. Okay, I'm just gonna take that call in a minute. I just wanna finish reading this here before we move on. So I was luckily or very surprised, very surprised at how busy it was. So here now we have to look and see at how something is happening. It's a state or a condition. After I had finished shopping, I threw the bags into the trunk completely or quickly. So I have that call on the line. Good evening, call and welcome. Um, good day. Hi, good day. What's your name? Tina Nice to have you with us today. So we are looking at the first, up until the first answer there. So you're going to read that first line for me where it was beautiful. So it's going to read from here and give me the first answer here, right? So it was a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day with the sun shining brightly. Excellent job. Brightly. Thank you so much for that call. So know that brightly in this case, or this adverb brightly makes more sense here. It's more appropriate. Thank you. I slowly or excitedly phone my friends asking them to come over for a picnic. I'm going to take this other call here. Hi. Good evening, caller. Hi. Hi. What's your name? My name is Juliana Cedrus. Nice to have you with us. Can you give me, read the second from I, read from I, and give me that second answer there. I excitedly phone my friends asking them to come over for a picnic. Excellent job. So excitedly, right? Yes. Right. So this is, a, this is an exciting occasion. So you're not going to take yes. your time. Right. Excellent job. Thank you so much for that call. So remember, you have to read in context. I gently or happily drove into town to buy some food and drink. How are you driving to town? Call me. Let me know. Is it gently? Is it happily? Any takers here? Let's see. Great. You have a call on the line. Good evening. Call on. Welcome. Hello. Hi, good evening. What's your name? My name is Sienna. Sienna? Yeah. Okay, hi Sienna. Welcome. Can you answer for me or give me the next answer there? I gently or happily? Happily. Happily. Excellent job. I happily drove into town to buy some food and drink. Thank you so much for that call. Great. Let's move on. When I got to town, I was luckily or very surprised at how busy it was. We have another call on the line. Good evening, call and welcome. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi, good evening, how are you? Good evening, caller. I am well, I am not a student, I'm a parent and also a teacher and I just want to thank you and Phil for doing a great job and helping the students. You're quite welcome, it's our pleasure. Thank you so much for calling. Great. Hello. Hi, good evening. Hello, good evening. Hi, what's your name? Khadija Marie. Hi, Khadija. So, are you going to give us the next answer there? Sure. Okay, what, what do you think the answer is going to be? Yes, I am. Okay, what do you think the answer is going to be? Can you say that again? Very. Very, very good. So very surprised at how busy it was. Thank you so much for calling. You're welcome. Great, and we have a last, one last answer here, it's complete. After I had finished shopping, I threw the bags into the trunk, quickly or completely. Think about it, you're in a hurry to go home. You wanna get to this picnic. How are you gonna throw that bag? Describe for me, how are you gonna throw that bag? Which adverb are you going to use there? And if you chose quickly, you are quite correct. So quickly there was our last answer to complete this excerpt here. Thank you so much for calling. Great, so we're gonna hold up on the calls a little bit. And now I want to continue with joining sentences. So we already started the topic of joining sentences where we would use adverbs or adjectives and or, or to join sentences. Now what we are gonna look at today, we are gonna see how we can use conjunctions and relative pronouns to join sentences as well. So you are seeing here, there's actually quite a lot of ways in which you can join sentences. So it's really a matter of choice, however you choose to write. And like I said, variety is always wel welcomed. So you have conjunctions and relative pronouns. Last day we touched on conjunctions a little bit. 
where we went into coordinating and subordinating conjunctions. But we just touched on it. So I want to show you today how, how we are going to use conjunctions to actually join sentences. So first of all, you must know what a conjunction is. And by now, I know a lot of you already do. You know, it's a joining word. It can be used to join two words, sentences, phrases, or clauses. So look at this sentence here. Mommy is washing the dishes. Daddy is cooking. Now, which conjunction can we use here to join that sentence, right? You should know. Think to yourself, you know a lot of conjunctions. Think which one is best, which one I should use to join the sentence. So I chose while mommy is washing the dishes, while daddy is cooking. So that's great there. Now this here, what I have behind me, before I move on to this, I just want to remind you all of some coordinating conjunctions which we came across when we were talking about compound sentences. And I wonder who can remember what are coordinating conjunctions. I'm just going to give you a second. Think about it. Let's see if you remember. Right, there was a special acronym given. And I told you all you can use that to remember conjunctions whenever. Whenever you're writing and you want to identify conjunctions, you can use that. And if you said fanboys, or you were thinking fanboys, you are correct, right? And what does that fanboy stand for? For, and, nor, but, and so on. And, yet, and, so. So we, and then we had a lot more conjunctions. We had subordinating conjunctions. So we had to know when to use coordinating conjunctions and when to use subordinating conjunctions. So, and then we have all of these other conjunctions here some of which is also subordinating conjunctions. So the list for conjunctions is actually pretty long. It's quite a long list, but it's just important that you know the common ones, the ones that you use all the time in your writing. You have been using it uh, since you have begun writing, actually. You know, you were introduced to conjunctions probably from the age of seven at standard one, right? So by now you are quite familiar with a lot of conjunctions. So uh, we have some here, as, even, whenever, until, since. And as you are seeing them there, I want you to think in your mind, how can I use any of these conjunctions seen here to join a sentence? And I know a lot of you have already some popping ideas, right? How you use since, or how you use although, or even though, or unless. How you use all of those to join sentences, right? Good. So now I have here just a few, just a few sentences. I'm going to leave the lines open there. I want you to call. Let me know which conjunction you would use for sentence one, two, and three. So I have I already put here options for you. Just to narrow it down, I want you to choose the most suitable option or the most suitable option here that fits in with the sentence. And if you look at number one, you would see mommy mopped the floor. It was dirty. You have two sentences there, two simple sentences. Now, remember the, the idea or the aim of this lesson is for you to use conjunctions to join sentences. So I want you to use a conjunction to actually join the sentence, make it one sentence. I'm gonna give this caller on the line a chance to help me out here. Good evening, caller, and welcome. Hi, is this a Hazel? Yes, it is. Walaikum well, assalam, what's your name? Javed again. Hi, Javed. So we're looking at number one there. I want you to read for me number one and give me your choice of conjunction. Which conjunction would fit best into that sentence? Because. Because. So read the entire sentence. Let's see. Mommy mopped the floor because it was dirty. Very good. So because here is actually correct. Thank you so much for calling. So we chose because if we said although, then that is contradicting what, what mommy is actually doing. So why, if we said mommy mopped the floor although it was dirty, it's already dirty, you know? So you have to choose the best option there, which is because we're given a reason. We have another, another call on the line. Good evening, call and welcome. I'll be to the next question. Yes, yeah, sure. Can you give me your name first? Okay, great to have you with us. We're looking at number two. I want you to read both sentences, then give me your final answer in that sentence. 
So Amelia passed. Amelia passed her exam. She placed she placed first nationwide. Right. Amelia passed her exam and placed first nationwide. Excellent job. So your correct answer or conjunction is and. Please note how we are using the conjunctions here to join sentences. Where we have two sentences, two simple sentences, and then we are making them into one. We're using a conjunction to join that sentence. Sorry? Sorry, Cole, I didn't realize you were still on line there. Would you like to attempt number three as well? I'm not sure if I lost that call there. Okay, so you're looking at number three now. The dog chased after the cat. He was tired. So two things going on here, right? The dog chased after the cat, now he's tired. So I want you to choose the most suitable conjunction here and plug it in your sentence to join that sentence. So the dog chased after the cat, something, he was tired. I have a call on the line. Good evening, call and welcome. Um, hello. Hi, good evening. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Stefano. Okay, great to have you with us. So, we are looking at number three now. Can you tell me which conjunction you would use here? Until. Until, excellent job. So your correct answer, correct conjunction in this case is until. Thank you so much for calling. Great, so so far we looked at conjunctions, a list of them and then we use them to join sentences. I'm just gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we have some more for you. Please stay tuned with C-Results. IBN can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go. Assalamu alaikum, good evening, and welcome back to See Results. I am Naila, and we are going through step by step all the stages in creative writing, all the its and bits that we need to know about creative writing. Before the break, if you're not joining me, before the break, we started talking about ways to join sentences. And we have already discussed a number of ways in which we can join sentences. And some of those include by using adverbs, adjectives, and now we are using conjunctions. So right behind me, before the break, we just did a couple questions where we had to choose the most appropriate conjunction to join our sentence. This here is another way you can join sentences. So you are up to number three in ways to join sentences. So I expect some variety in your sentences, whether it's submissions on our Edmodo page or you are writing a school, more importantly, getting prepared for your exam, use it, apply it, apply all of this knowledge, create variety, impress your teachers, impress yourself, impress your parents, right? We want to do our best. Now we're gonna look at another way which is the last way for joining sentences in this program, we are going to look at relative pronouns. We're going to look at how we can use relative pronouns to join sentences as well. So first of all, you need to know what are your relative pronouns. So there are a number of different pronouns. You know, you have a subject, your object, your possessive, your reflective, and then you have your relative. There are numerous pronouns, right? All of which you also need to be aware of. 
So your relative pronouns. So these are your general relative pronouns. You have who, whom, whose, which, and that. So we are just going to be focusing on this five here, and we are going to see how we can use them and actually use them in our writing to make interesting sentences. So who? When do you use who? How many of you get problems at home or at school when you are writing and you confuse who with whom or which with that or whether, how do I know when to use whose? It's a very tricky topic. You are not alone. A lot of students make this mistake. But like I said, practice, practice, and practice. That is what you need that is key in helping you to become better at creative writing. Also, what is really important in creative writing is reading. You need to read a lot. You may, it may seem like you do not have time, but we have a lot of time. We have time, so we have time to go outside and play. We have time to play a game on our PlayStation, probably look at some cartoons. In that time, try just for the sake of SEA, you know, it's around the corner. Sacrifice a little bit, pick up a book, something educational, something to your liking, whatever you like, whatever interests you, and read. You know, look at the way that the author is expressing his language, his emotion. Look at the vocabulary usage. Look at the type of sentences. In mentioning that, like I said, next week we are going to be choosing a couple pieces of submissions from the Edmodo page. We are going to look at those submissions here, and we are going to talk about how we can make it better, what we can add, what we can take out, and help you get started in writing the best paragraph and then, by, by extension, stories, right? So let's go back to relative pronouns a bit. Who? Who is used to refer to persons? We're talking about people, we're going to use who. But then, when we're talking about people, referring to people, we can also use whom. So we are going to see how we can use who and when to use whom. Whose, also another tricky one, use to show possession. We are going to look at that as well. How you can use whose in a sentence. Which, used to refer to animals and things. That, used to refer to people, animals, and things. Just a point to note here, while we can use that to refer to people, we want to refrain from using that to refer to people. We already have the relative pronouns who and whom to help us refer to people. While that would, would not be incorrect if you refer to people, we just would prefer or encourage you to use that to refer to animals and to things, right? So that's a, just, for something, just, for, just something for you to remember there when you are writing. Now, let's look at who and whom. So we're going to know, we're going to learn how to use who and whom and when to use it. So I wonder how many of you here know that who should be used to refer to the subject of a sentence. And also, last day, we touched on subject of a sentence a little bit, where we identify what is the subject and what is the predicate in our simple sentences. So you need to know what is the subject of a sentence, but I trust that you do know that already. You know, you're long past that stage. There's, you know the subject, or you can identify the subject of your sentence. So the who is used to refer to the subject of the sentence. If you can replace a noun with he or she, use who. Now, I'm going to say this again. If you can replace the noun with he or she, use who. I'm going to explain what that means in a minute. But before we get to that, you should know what are your subject pronouns. So if I have Carla, I should know which subject pronoun to use there. She. Or if I have Tom, I can replace it with he. So you need to know your subject pronouns. That's really, really important here in using who and whom. Let's look at the example here and let's analyze this really closely. We have Adrian is the youngest child. He is the youngest child. Who is the youngest child? How did we arrive at he and how did we arrive at, arrive at who? Let us look closely at this. Remember, if you can replace the noun, if you can replace the noun with he or she, use who. And you also should remember that who is used or to refer to the subject of your sentence. So keeping that in mind now, 
Let's first identify the subject of our sentence here, and, or even our noun, Adrian. Adrian is a subject of, of our sentence. It's a who or what of our sentence. So Adrian is the youngest child. So fine, we have that sentence. But now remember, we want to use who. So let's see how we're getting from Adrian to who. Look at line two. He is the youngest child. How did I get he? How did I arrive at the subject pronoun he? That's simple. I replace my subject. I replace my subject with my subject pronoun. So instead of Adrian, so if I'm writing a paragraph, I wouldn't say Adrian, Adrian, Adrian. I would say Adrian, or I can use he. I'm replacing my subject with he. So see that simple transition there? First step was to change my noun into my subject pronoun, he. Now, he is the youngest child. But how did we get who? We simply got who because following the rule, if you can, the rule is if you can replace a noun with he or she, use who. So we have our noun here, which is he, or if it was she, same thing, we're gonna replace it with who. It can be replaced with who. So now it becomes who is the youngest child. As simple as that. First you identify your subject, you change your subject, into your subject pronoun or you substitute your subject using a subject pronoun and then you substitute your subject pronoun with the word who or the relative pronoun who because it can be replaced once it is used with he or she. I hope you understand that, understood that a little bit. Um, so let's look at this sentence here and this is going to help us understand how we can use the relative pronoun who to join sentences as what we are learning today. So first we learned how to use who, now we're going to use who, the relative pronoun, to join a sentence. So I have my sentence here, Cindy, or sentences for that matter, Cindy is a small child, Cindy got lost. I have two sentences, Cindy is a small child, Cindy got lost. How am I going to use my relative pronoun who to join the sentence and how do I know to use who? Let's look at it. We have Cindy here which is our subject. If you're writing a paragraph, or some, some of you are guilty of this, right? You write a paragraph at school, or you write an essay, and every line you have the name of the person, Cindy, Cindy, Cindy. That's, where, that, that's a common error. We should not repeat the name or pronoun all the time. We can substitute it using a subject pronoun. That is why we have those. So now Cindy will become, what's our subject pronoun for Cindy? Is Cindy female or is she male? So she is actually female. So we'll say, she. So note how simple this is getting. We identified our subject, we changed our subject using our subject pronoun, and remember we said if it is followed by she or he, we can use, we can use who. So I'm just gonna go back to that and read this for you. If you can replace the noun, which is Cindy, with he or she, which we did, use who. So this is what my sentence becomes. Cindy Cindy is the small child and I know to use who because I can replace my noun, my subject pronoun there with who, who got lost. Very simple there. Right, we know to use who because we're simply, we replace the subject pronoun with who because it is a he or a she. Let's look at this other example here. She is the girl, she won a national award. She is a girl, she won a national award. First step, identify your subject. We have our subject here. Second step, we need to know that if the noun can be replaced with he or she, then it is using who, or it is followed by who. It is already done for us. It is already done for us. We have a noun here, or subject pronoun, she. And we know whether it's he or she, we know that if you can replace a noun with he or she, we use 
who. So now it becomes she is the girl who won a national award. Excuse my handwriting here. Please forgive me. But the important thing to note here is how to use who in your sentence. Remember that's the objective here. We want to use our relative pronoun to join sentences. Now that was the easy one in my opinion. Look at whom. How are we going to use whom? So whom should be used to refer to the object of the verb or preposition. So here we need to know what is the object of the verb or the object of a sentence, because finally, once you know the object, you can identify the object of the verb or the preposition, whichever is used in your sentence. It may not always be a preposition, may not always be a verb. But what you need to know, you need to know what is the object of a sentence, who is receiving the action, and you need to know as well, just as, just as you needed to know subject pronouns, now you need to know object pronouns. So, keeping that in mind, you have to also note if you can replace the noun with him or her, use whom. So, instead of he or she, now we're using him or her, our object pronouns. That is why it's key for you to know or to be able to identify your object pronouns. Because when you see him or her, you know to use whom. And when you see he or she, you know those are subject pronouns and to use who. So if you can replace a noun with him or her, use whom. Let's look at the example here. Shreya teaches joy. She teaches her. Who teaches whom? How did we arrive from sentence one to sentence three? Let's see. We have here, Shreya is our subject. Here we have Shreya, which is our subject. And teaches who? Joy, which becomes our object. She's the person whom the action is being done to. Shreya teaches joy. We know our subject, we know our object. We have identified those. Now, we said our subject, if it can be replaced by he or she, use who? And if our object can re be replaced by him or her, use whom? So that's how we got she here. Replace Shreya, which is a girl, with our subject pronoun she, and replace our object, our object or our noun here with her and her. So now it becomes a little more simple. We have she teaches her. Now we said if the noun can be replaced, if the noun can be replaced using he or she, use who. That's how we got who. And if the object here can be replaced, or the noun rather, can be replaced using her or him, use whom. And that's how we got who teaches whom. So I'm just going to go this over one more time. First, we have to identify our subject. Shreya is our subject here. Shreya teaches joy. Joy is our object of the sentence. Now, now we need to remember if you can replace the noun with him or her, use whom. So we need to find out if we can replace Shreya, our subject, with she. And can we? Yes, we can. That is our subject of the sentence. That's how we get she, our subject pronoun. And her, we're looking at her. Her is our object, our object pronoun. And if you can, if you can replace your noun, your noun here, with him or her, it becomes whom. So that's how we ended up with who teaches whom. Let's look at the sentence here or the sentences here. We are now going to use whom in our sentence or to join our sentence. So knowing when to use who and whom is one aspect of it. But you need to know how to use it to join a sentence, which is key here, which is what we want you to actually do. This is the actual lesson or the skill that we are actually teaching you here. So look at this sentence here, these sentences. This is my neighbor. I like him a lot. Those of you at home, I want you to think about the answer here. How am I going to join the sentence? Are we going to use who or are we going to use whom? And how are we going to use it and where are we going to put it, right? So this 
is my neighbor I'm just going to leave this here who or whom I like very much reason I left that there I want you to identify your subject identify your object and then you will be able to determine whether to use who or whom so look at it closely this is my neighbor I like him a lot I'm going to leave that for you to do I'm going to leave you to find out your subject determine your object and let me know if to use who or whom we have to take a quick break shortly for the Maghreb Adhan. So when we come back, we are going to continue looking at the sentences and we are going to find the correct answer or the suitable relative pronoun to complete these sentences. So we have this sentence here and while this is up, look at this here. This is my sister. You met her last week. So you need to tell me whether it's who or whom. Write your answers on your paper and have your answers ready for me when we come back. We're just going to take a short break and I'll see you in a few minutes.
Good evening and welcome back to See Results. Uh, for those of you who are just joining me, probably you just now got home from work, from school, lessons, whatever it is, welcome and thank you so much for joining us and viewing with us. And especially, um, I just want to say a good evening to, to all the Facebook viewers as well. A really loyal um, fan base there. Thank you so much for all your support. Just a reminder for those of you at home or even those of you who are watching us on Facebook, especially if you're watching on Facebook, as a matter of fact, we want you to share this live feed, share it with your friends, family, you know, just share it. We want to get as much people on board, let them benefit from this program as much as possible, right? Okay, so before the break, we were just looking at ways we can extend sentences. So before I said actually this is the third way to join sentences, uh, that was my mistake there, is actually this is the third way we can extend sentences. We can extend sentences by adding adjectives and adverbs and this is an additional way or a third way using conjunctions and relative pronouns. So here we are using relative pronouns. We are, we are at who and whom. So we are, no, we're going to, we are learning how to use who, which we have already done, and now we are learning how to use whom. So just a refresher there, I'm just going to go back one slide, and we're just going to go through this before we move forward, just as a little recap before that break. We just need to remember when to use whom. All you need to do here, and remember, is if you can replace a noun with him or her, use whom, right? So looking at the sentence as we were before. This is my neighbor, I like him a lot. This is my neighbor, whom I like a lot. And before the break, I asked you all to come up with an answer, whether it's who or whom. If you are whom, you are quite correct. A hint in the sentence, you have him. You already have that object pronoun for you there. And you know, if you have the object pronoun, him or her, you know to use whom. Similarly, in this sentence, or these sentences here, these two, this is my sister, you met her last week. Now, how are we going to join this sentence? You can say, I'll write over here. This is my sister, who or whom you met. last week. Similarly, in the sentence above where the object pronoun was identified for you, similarly it is done here as well, who. So that's an indication, that's a hint that you need to use whom. Right, simple enough, two simple rules, you just need to practice it, remember it, start using it. Continuing with our relative pronouns, we are now at that and which. Now that and which can be used interchangeably in most cases, right? You will see um, sometimes you're writing a sentence and you're thinking whether to use that or which. Now it will depend on the context, of course, but sometimes if you use that or which interchangeably, your answer will still be correct or your grammar there is still correct. That is used to indicate a specific object. So we already know how to use that in a sentence, right? So it's in, used to indicate a specific object, item, person, condition. As in the sentence number one, this is how we usually use that in a sentence. The movie that I just saw is a big hit in Asia. Here, it is specific. This is what we are saying when that is specific. But this is not how we use it to join a sentence. Remember, the idea of this lesson is to use relative pronouns to join a sentence. So look at sentence number two. They heard some news. The news surprised them. We are taking two sentences. We are joining it to make one sentence. They heard some news. The news surprised them. They heard some news that surprised them. Notice how we use a relative pronoun that. If I said they heard some news which surprised them, will, will I be wrong? Technically I will not be wrong, okay? You just need to know and remember to read in context and try to use that or which, which is more suitable to your writing. So we're coming very close to the end of time there. So I'm just going to do which really quickly and then we're going to wrap up. Next day we are going to continue with this lesson with of relative pronouns. So we're looking at which. Which is used to add information to objects, items, people, situations, etc. Look at sentence one. Dogs which make great pets can be expensive, right? So we have sentence two. Sentence one here is how we usually use which. 
But like in sentence two, the idea of what we are learning is to use a relative pronoun, which in this case, to join sentences. Here we have Joe bought a sofa set. It was ordered from Italy. Now I want to make that or join that using a relative pronoun to make one sentence. Joe bought a so so sorry, this is supposed to be sofa here. So Joe bought a sofa set, which was ordered from Italy. Notice how I use which here to join that sentence. Okay, folks, so we are almost out of time. I just want to remind you all, um, if you missed this video, or you want to share this video, please go on our live stream, share it, review it, and so on. Also, submissions still open for on our Edmodo page. Do not miss that. Do not miss next week. And stay tuned right after the short break. So Ijaz is coming up with mathi mathi mat sorry, mathematics, and you don't want to miss that. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Let's get as many people as we can involved in our program. And I'm happy to report that day by day, the subscriptions on both the Facebook as well as the Edmodo page continues to grow. As of 4.59 p.m. this afternoon, the deadlines for the assignments which were given last week would have come up, all right? So you all won't be able to submit anything further. Those assignments would have been based on the work that we did last week, all right? So come Friday evening, Saturday morning, we're gonna post further assignments for you all to do, which will be based on the work that we have covered this week, okay? And, in, and for this batch of um, assignments, we had an English language arts assignment, we had a creative writing assignment, 
as well as a mathematics assignment. I had a chance to review some of the results this morning, but I'm sure more would have come in by the time the deadline had reached, and we will give you a breakdown on those results um, once more on Monday. Okay, so we're doing mathematics at the moment. So far, we've touched on two of the four streams that are tested in the SCA exam, right? The two that we have looked at so far are number and measurement, all right? And for those of you who haven't subscribed to our Edmodo page, you can go to www.edmodo.com or download the Edmodo app and use this code that's present on your screen right now, and that will grant you access to our page, okay? So please subscribe, um, parents, subscribe them, standard four students, standard five students. We welcome you to join us, all right? So we're gonna touch on the third stream of mathematics, which is the geometry, and then we'll be moving on to statistics on our next class, right? Provided that we get through all the geometry we want to do today. As we said, we're not teaching it in a totally sequential manner. We're giving you a little bit from every topic and trying to spread it out so that we'll cover as wide an area of topics as we possibly can before the exam because we know that time is limited, right? But we hope that you all are gonna benefit. So far, we've been emphasizing the section one type questions in the four streams because we wanna build on the foundation before we go up to the section two and three type questions, which are going to be naturally more difficult as they are with more marks. Okay, so one of the topics that is commonly tested in geometry is the quarter turn, all right? And in the entire paper, there's actually only seven geometry questions, three in section one, three in section two, and one in section three, okay? And what is geometry, by the way, before we start to discuss what the quarter turn is, all right? The geometry is the branch of mathematics that deals with points, lines, shapes, and space, all right? So for the aspiring artists, the aspiring engineers, um, technicians, those of you who like working with figures, um, this might be the topic in mathematics or the branch or the stream of mathematics that most appeals to you. And it is indeed quite fun because many of these shapes and many of these um, solids have very interesting properties that we have been able to exploit as a human species to our benefit, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and we hope that you all are gonna use your knowledge for good for the betterment, for the betterment of society and of, of course in your personal development. All right, so for the SCA, we need to have some familiarity with both plane and solid geometry. Those of most of you listening now are in standard four or five, so you're aware that there are plane shapes, which are two-dimensional, and there are um, solid shapes, which are three-dimensional. Okay, so we have the squares and the rectangles, the triangles, which are plane, and we have the solids like the pyramids and cones and spheres and cubes and cuboids and so on. Now we're gonna delve more into that as, we, as the questions emerge, okay? So that is, in a nutshell, what the subject of geometry covers. It's all about space, spatial relationships, and how lines and points and shapes and solids interplay with each other, okay? All right, so this is a question that you might likely encounter as you open your SEA paper and you reach to the, to the geometry sec, um, segment or, or part of section one, right, the questions 15 to 17 or thereabouts, you will find a question and you're going to see this clock face. Now, bear in mind that we already did time, time which also relies heavily on an understanding of this clock face. But these questions are not so much so concerned with time, although I will show you how we can use the knowledge that we gained of time to come up with an alternate way to solve some of these problems, okay? So we wanna make sure that we are not just only learning things just for sake of memorization, but we wanna develop our critical thinking skills because we want to have a, a populace, a, a society of critical thinkers that are able to solve problems, that are able to use the information that they have in novel ways and creative ways and not just to regurgitate what you may have heard or what you may have read, okay? So it's important to be able to critically apply what it is that you know. So this question says that the long hand on the clock moves to 10. All right, and last week we would have learned that the long hand is the minute hand, right? 
I am sure that most of you at home who are already tuned in from last week would have known this. All right? And how many quarter turns did it make? The long hand on the clock moves to 10, sorry. So it's currently pointing at one and it moves to 10. How many quarter turns did it make? Now, I'm, before I start to take calls for this segment today, I'm just gonna teach you a little bit of the foundational knowledge that we need to have in order to approach this question. All right, so bear in mind that the lines are open and I'll start taking calls very shortly. The numbers will be provided for you on the screen, right? Um, you all can take a look at those right now and bear them in mind, have them at the ready. But in the meantime, what do we need to know to answer this question? What is a quarter turn to begin with? A quarter turn refers to a change in direction of 90 degrees. Now, if that sounds like gibberish to you, don't worry, in a few minutes it will no longer, right? Because we're gonna clarify. 90 degrees is one quarter of a circle, hence we say quarter turn, right? So a 90 degree turn is a quarter turn. Great, that applies to all circles. But this question specifically tests our knowledge of the clock, right? And we are, they use a circular clock face, which is the predominant type of clock face, right? It's the one that we think of when we, when we picture a clock, a circular face, right? And a circle in totality has 360 degrees, okay? So if I begin, if I begin at one point in my circle, and I move all the way around, right? I would have completed a 360 degree turn, right? Or a full complete turn. If I stood at the middle of the circle and I was facing in this direction, and I'm standing here, and I rotate my body so that my gaze moves along the circumference of the circle, by the time I reach back here, I would have made a complete turn. But if I'm standing at the center, looking due north, all right? And we're gonna get into the cardinal points very soon, right? And I move, or I shifted my gaze from here to here, I would have shifted my gaze a total of 90 degrees, and 90 degrees is one quarter of a circle, okay? We can break these fractions down if you know your nine, time, nine times table enter one quarter, and I hope you all are very familiar with your one to 12 times tables, especially for your essay exams, right? You need to know those for sure. You can learn even further than that, but at bare minimum, you must know those one to, well, two to 12 times table, okay? So this is our quarter turn, all right? But what if I'm now facing this direction, and I hear a noise somewhere down here, all right, and I decide to shift my gaze again to the direction that was, to, I guess the, this would be the right of me. It might be the opposite based on how you're viewing it, right? But the point is I'm facing in this direction here that I'm demarking here on the screen right now, and I turn my body to a sound that I hear below here. I would have turned a further 90 degrees, which is a further quarter turn, all right? So I've done another quarter turn, and all together, I would have turned a total of how much? Of 90 plus 90, which would be 180 degrees. So I would have made what? A half turn. A half turn or two quarter turns, all right? Two quarter turns, all right? So the sound that I was hearing down here you know, maybe some animal, I'm out in the bushes, hiking, I'm out there hunting, I'm doing something with my elder siblings and cousins, maybe even my dad and my uncles. The sound seems to move to this direction now, in this area. So I turn again, I would have turned a further 90 degrees, I would have turned my attention another further 90 degrees, and made another quarter turn for a grand total from where my initial gaze was of three quarter turns, right? And guess what? This animal, this manicou, it's moving at a blistering pace and it gets all the way up here, all right? And I turn my attention this way. 
and I end up looking right back where I was looking in the first place, I would have completed one more quarter turn, one more 90 degree turn, or one complete turn. Do you all understand that? I hope that you do. All right, so the circle is divided into quarters, and each 90 degree segment of the circle, or sector of the circle, is a quarter turn. How does this relate to time now? All right, on a clock, the hour hand makes a quarter turn every three hours. Guess why? How many numbers, or what numbers are there on a clock face? We have the numbers one to 12. What is a quarter of 12 students out there listening? A quarter of 12 is three, right? Four threes are 12. So the hour hand makes a quarter turn every three hours. And the minute hand makes a quarter turn every 15 minutes because we learned last week that an hour has 60 minutes. What is a quarter of 60? Right, you might not know this one off the bat, but if you work it out, you will find that a quarter of 60 is 15, all right? You divide 60 by four, you are going to get 15, all right? So the three hours is equivalent to the 90 degrees, right? Which is equivalent to the quarter turn, right? On the other hand, okay? And the 15 minutes, but the minute hand or the long hand is equivalent to the same 90 degrees, which is equivalent to the same quarter turn, okay? So in terms of a raw geometric figure of a circle, we know that a quarter is 90 degrees. When we translate that to the clock, we know that a quarter of 12 is three, okay? So every three hours, the clock would have made, or the, the, the hour hand on the clock would have made a quarter turn. Every 15 minutes, the minute hand on the clock would have made a quarter turn, right? By our understanding of fractions. And when we get back into the topic of number, eventually, after we do some statistics, we are going to have a look at fractions for sure. All right, so now that you've gained this knowledge or this little insight that I've just did my best to try to convey to you, we here have here our question, our first question, the, and um, the lines are open now. So have a read at the question. Maybe you might want to sketch a little clock on a sheet of paper. Maybe you'll be just fine looking at it on the screen. Maybe you might want to walk up to the television screen and try to figure it out, right? Um, that's the beauty of this format of the program. And tell me that if the minute hand, or the long hand as the question says, which we already know is the minute hand now, it moves to 10. How many quarter turns did the hand make? Do I have any takers for this question? The lines are open. Feel free to call us. So the minute hand, it was there pointing at one, and it's now pointing at 10. And I do have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to See Results on IBN TV. Hi. Hi, good evening. Good evening. And do you have, a, uh, what's your name and where you're calling from, sorry? Jada Henry. Welcome, welcome, Miguel. And do you have an answer for us? Yes. Tell me, please. The answer is three quarters. Three quarter turns. And how did you get that, Miguel? Because from when you're from, from two to four is one quarter. Right, from so. From four to seven is two quarters. And from seven to ten is three quarters. All right. And that, sir, is very correct. Just you made, you made one slight error, but I know that you know the right answer. It's from one to four is one quarter, right? Not from yeah. two to four, but thank you so much. Well done. And please join our Edmodo site if you haven't done so. Thank you, parents, for allowing Miguel to call us today. All right? So let's, let's break this down for those of you who are still have those, you know, question marks floating above your head at the moment. The minute hand was initially at one. Let's see how many quarters it took to get to 10, all right? We said that every 15 minutes, the minute hand moves one quarter, right? How do we know when it moves 15 minutes? By our lesson on time, we know that every time it passes three distinct numbers, it would have gone through 15 minutes, right? So one quarter 
would have taken us from one to four. That would have been our first quarter. Then, as Miguel correctly said, our next quarter would have taken us from four to seven, which gave us our final quarter, uh, sorry, our second quarter, and the final quarter to make the whole transition over to 10 would have been from seven to 10, which is another three hours. You can count it, one, two, three. We could have done the same here, one, two, three, and one, two, three. So how many quarters does that make? Well, it's clearly three quarters. So the minute hand would have had to make three quarters or three quarter turns to go from one to 10. Thank you so much, that was well done. Excellently done there, Miguel. And now we'll move on to our next question on the agenda here, all right? The minute hand of the clock shown below made a three-quarter turn in a clockwise direction. To which number was the minute hand pointing before the three-quarter turn? Now, before you start calling me, and hang on a minute, I already see I have a call on the line. Remember that the hand on the clock moves in a, the hands on the clock move in a clockwise direction, okay? a clockwise direction from left to right. So, in our next question, I'm gonna take this caller now. Good evening and welcome to IBM. I think the remote problem that is. Hi, good evening, welcome to IBM. See results? Name? Hello? Hi, good evening, what's your name? Thank okay, so we seem to have lost that caller. Do we have another caller on the line? So I'm just gonna continue reading the question until we get back, until we get another caller, until that caller calls us back, right? The minute hand of the clock should made a three quarter turn in a clockwise direction. To which number was the minute hand pointing before the three quarter turn? All right, do we have any takers for this question? Where is the minute hand pointing currently? Good evening, caller, and welcome to IBN. You are looking at C results. Hi, good evening. My name is Sanjeev Mohammed, and I'm calling from Marabella. Hey, good evening, Sanjeev, and I have been seeing your participation and your activity on Edmodo. I thank you so much. You are quite active, um, and welcome to the program. So can you tell me where the minute hand was pointing before it made this three-quarter turn? It was pointing at it was pointing at 11. Yeah. Okay, sir. It's the one hand, which is at 11. Was it pointing at 11? Let's see. It's what I've, it made a turn in a, in a clockwise direction, which is this way, right? So in order for us to know where it came from, we have to go in an anti-clockwise direction, right? Oh, which is the opposite. Yes, so. Let's see, the first quarter, it would have gone from eight to seven to six to five, right? That would have been our first quarter. Our second quarter to four to three to two, great, one, two, three. And then the final quarter, it would have gone to one to 12 and to 11. And I do believe that that's what you said, right? Okay, very, very, very good, Sanjeev. Thank you for your call. Excellent work. Okay, so we started here, and we are moving back one quarter at a time to get to where it was before it made that three-quarter turn in an anti-clockwise direction. And a common mistake or a mistake you could have made is to do the three-quarter turns while continuing in a clockwise direction. And that would have given you a wrong answer, okay? So, very, very well done. Um, we're moving on to our second question. So, the minute hand of the clock, it was pointing at the 11, right? It was pointing at 11, and that is our answer. So again, this motion here, this one is the clockwise, right? And to do the opposite, we call it anti-clockwise, all right? So some of you out there may be, just, may be just getting a refresher on these terms, all right? So we have another question. Describe the angle through which a minute hand of a clock 
moves from 8 to 11. All right, so we have no diagram here to help us. What are we going to do? We should probably draw a diagram, all right? And look at it, think about it for a minute, and tell me the angle that the minute hand of a clock must have moved to go from 8 to 11. I do have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN. Hi, my name is Adrian. I call from Barakpo. Yeah. Welcome, Adrian, from Barakpo. And do you have um, an answer for us? Yes, I think the answer is a quarter. A quarter. And how did you get this quarter, Adrian? Because eight, yeah. eight, nine, ten, and eleven, that is three. Ah, boy. Well done. Congrats, Adrian. That is very correct. Okay? So what you could have done as a student in the exam is to draw a clock, right? Um, if it isn't immediately clear to you, but as Adrian just rightly did, he just counted the, the number of um, increments it would have moved, right, from 8, and it ended up at 11. Great, so you could have drawn a clock. A clock is very easy to draw. You just draw a, a rough sketch of a circle, right, and you number 12 from the top, and you go around equally spaced, and how many? Numbers would it have passed? Is this the minute hand? Yes, the minute hand we are dealing with. So it would have gone from 8 to 11, which is a total of 15 minutes, all right? Would have gone 1, 2, 3, which we know to be 1 quarter because a quarter of 12 is equal to 3. So. Describe the angle, oh my, I should have questioned Adrian further. So it went a quarter turn. It went one quarter turn and he was quite right. But the question also wants us to clarify further by giving the angle. And who out there was paying attention when I told you all what a quarter turn is in angles? How much degrees does a circle have and what is a quarter of that? So do I have any callers here to just talk off this question for us right now? I do have one. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hi, um, I'd like to answer a question. Sure. Can you tell me how many degrees or the angle which a minute um, makes? It's 90 degrees. Right. Very, very good. And what is your name, sir? Nicholas. Well done, Nicholas. Thank you so much. So our answer there is 90 degrees. Well done, well done. So far, everybody is doing a superb job. All of these are very representative of questions that you will be asked in the SEA. And so far, you're acing it. And this is what we love to see. And we hope that those of you there who may not have known that in true listening to the participation, that you all will be gaining knowledge on top of what it is we are teaching alongside the participation. And call in and participate even if you're not sure, because if you're going wrong, I will guide you, all right? And sometimes in making a mistake, it helps you to, to solidify or to keep in your mind th that knowledge that you did not have before, okay? So don't be afraid of failure. Sometimes you have to fail in order to succeed. So, to the failure now before we get into the exam room in April 2020, right? That's the whole purpose of this program. And we have a next question here on the screen now. Marissa is facing a northwesterly direction. She is facing a northwesterly direction. She makes a three quarter turn in a clockwise direction. Which direction will she now be facing? So now we've moved on from clocks into another way that we can manipulate the angles in a circle, which is our cardinal points. So again, you're gonna imagine a circle around this, right? Now, this is a freehand circle, so it's not going to be that pretty. But this is also a circle, and a quarter turn will remain 90 degrees, okay? So we do have a caller in the line. Um, good evening, caller. Welcome to IBN. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam and welcome to the program. Who am I speaking with? Ariana. Welcome, Ariana. And do you, can you tell us the answer to this question? If, if she's facing north and she takes a three quarter turn, she will end up in the west. But is she facing north? She is facing a north yes. westerly. 
So where is she facing? She's facing here. All right? So if she turned the first quarter, where, where would Marissa be gazing at after turning her first quarter? Can you tell me? Northeast. Very good. Northeast in the first quarter. Then the second quarter. Second quarter? Yeah, the second okay. quarter turn, yeah. South. South? No, um, southeast. Very good. Southeast. Very good. So they're ring on so far, Ariana. And the last quarter, where would she end up facing in that last quarter turn? Southwest. Excellent job, Ariana. Thank you so much for being brave and for staying on the line, even though you didn't have it right straight off the bat. We encourage this and we applaud this. Well done. Thank you so much for that call. So this time we're not just dealing with east, west, north, and south. There are some in between cardinal points. In fact, there are many. But we're going to deal with the main ones that you all might be tested on for your SEA, right? Which are those which divide the different cardinal points into two. So in between, as a matter of fact, I'm going to erase this and we're going to work through this properly because this is some new material. We've done the regular circle. We've also done the clock. Now let's look at how this all applies to our cardinal points, okay? So we have the four main ones, the ones that we all know growing up. We have north, we have east, we have south and we have west, right? The direction precisely in the middle of north and east is called northeast, all right? The one precisely between east and south, southeast, the one precisely between south and west, the southwest, and the one precisely between north and west, we give it northwest, all right? So, where did we start? Okay, but before we do that, between north and east, we have a quarter turn, right? This is a 90 degree angle. You may have seen this before in your studies, right? A 90 degree angle or a right angle, great? Which is also equivalent to a quarter turn. It's just another way to express it. We have 90 degrees, we have quarter turn, we have right angle, great? A quarter turn is a, is a right angle turn or a 90 degree turn. Then from east to south, we have yet another quarter. All right? From south to west, we have one more quarter turn. And then from west to north, we have our final quarter turn. But if we were to start at any one of these in between directions, all right, a quarter turn, and either direction will just take us to the next one, right? If it's a quarter turn northeast in a clockwise direction, that's gonna take us southeast. If it's a quarter turn in an anti-clockwise direction from northeast, that's going to take us to the northwest direction, all right? So it's the same principle, really. You just have to recognize where to start counting your quarter turns from, which was the slight mistake that Ariana will have made just now. All right, so Marissa in our question is facing the northwest, and this is already drawn for you on your paper, by the way, so you don't have to stress too much about it. Right, northwest, and she makes a three quarter turn. As we can see, this here is one quarter, right? Then we turn again, another quarter, and we turn our third quarter, and this is all in an in a clockwise direction, right? In a clockwise direction, and this is why we're not going the other way. So she would have been facing northwest, and when she makes that quarter turn, she would have ended her gaze on, or in the direction of southwest, okay? We're gonna take a short break now, and we'll be back with some more geometry. can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go to the Google Play Store, search for the Airlink TV app. 
download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. Great news! With Trinidad Fresh, you get 70% real fruit juice and it's available in Fruit Punch, Orange and Apple. Good evening, assalamu alaikum, and welcome back to See Results on IBN TV. So, so far we've been uh, tackling the topic of quarter turns, which is our first topic that we have been, that we've elected to do in our lessons to you on geometry, right? We are on geometry now. We're in the third stream of the mathematics SCA paper, the others being number measurement. We're on geometry and we're gonna be moving on to statistics on Monday, God willing. So, we've had some very brave callers call us so far and tackled these questions of the quarter turns. So now, we're gonna look at yet another type of question that comes under the geometry segment of the paper, which has to deal with lines of symmetry, okay? So, I'm just gonna show you the question that I want answered, and there's a lot of information that we need to know before answering these questions. So, I'm gonna walk you through that knowledge before we attempt to answer the question through taking calls, okay? So, the question is, which of the quadrilaterals below has one line of symmetry? So, we need to know a couple of things, and I'm gonna ask you to hold the calls for now until we have an understanding of what these terms mean, because there might be a lot of people at home who, although they might intuitively know what these things are in daily life, they may not necessarily know the mathematical terms for them, right? So students, this is for you, and parents, this is also for you when you're helping your child in their studies at home and in understanding how to answer these questions, all right? And also remember that every time we go live here on Facebook and, the, and it's live has ended, you can always come back into our videos on the page, rewatch anything that was unclear. You can get the answers there, you can get the information that you want there, and you can also send us messages in our Edmodo group. If you're now joining us, have a look through the page. It's the second picture in our, in our cover um, photo reel that where we have the information on how to sign up, right? You go to edmodo.com and there is an access code. I will also bring it again on screen at the end of this. We are going to be posting new questions on the work that was done this week, either tomorrow evening or more realistically for this week on Saturday morning. And those questions, you will have almost an entire week to do them. The topics that we've covered this week range are very wide ranging actually. We did um, some work on time which was already tested and we are doing geometry now. We have done a lot of further creative writing as well as in the English language arts. We've done some more grammar and those quizzes and those assignments will be there. Your child has an opportunity to be featured on our program when we put up our list of top performers week per week, all right? And we are also going to be asking permission to use some of their writing to show how they've applied or misapplied some of the rules that we would have tried to impart to them in their creative writing. The math and the English language arts assignments, those are marked instantaneously. You just go on, you do the quiz, you hit review quiz, and at the end, you're gonna get the score and you will be able to assess how well you've done. Not only that, you're going to get the correct answers. And if you don't understand why the answer is, what the answer is, you can always go rewatch the video for that specific assignment 
or you can send us a message or leave a comment below the quiz on Edmodo. How does that sound? That sounds amazing, doesn't it? So that's why we're encouraging you to like us on Facebook, to watch the program on IBN on TV, and to, to share it with others. Tell them about, tell them to come home and to join us every evening. Tell them to follow our page. Tell them about signing up for Edmodo. It's all free, it's all for you, it's for the benefit of all the kids in the nation who are going to be writing SCA next year and the previous year, okay? So back to our mathematics now. Which of the quadrilaterals below has one line of symmetry, right? What is a line of symmetry? And what is a quadrilateral? That's what we're going to discuss at the moment, all right? So, and again, like I said, to give everyone a fair shot at answering, I'm going to go through some basic knowledge before we open the lines up for the course. What is a quadrilateral? Big word, guys. Quad means four, right? And lateral means literal, literally means side, right? So it's a four-sided figure, a four-sided shape. Our quadrilaterals are plain, meaning they are flat, they are two-dimensional and they must be closed, in other words, they must not have open ends, right? What do I mean by that? So, right, it stops just short of connecting. That would not be a proper quadrilateral because it would be open in that case and not closed. All right, I'm just highlighting this area over here where it remains open, okay? Its sides are straight, all right, so, we won't consider a floppy, four-sided, closed figure as a quadrilateral either because the sides here would be very curved, all right? So those aren't technically the qu a quadrilateral, all right? It must have four vertices. Four vertices meaning four edges, all right? And the angles within a quadrilateral, they sum to 360 degrees just like a circle, all right? But however, unlike a circle, we actually have sides here, right? Clearly defined sides in our quadrilateral. So we can put all of those properties together, and let's look here at an irregular quadrilateral. What do I mean by that? There are some quadrilaterals that we have to know because there are special types of quadrilaterals that have specific properties that you're going to be tested on in the SEA and that you should just know about in your day-to-day -day life as well. Most of them, or some of them, we would know already. Others we may not be so clear on, so that's what we're going to spend some time now doing, understanding what is a quadrilateral, all right? So does this have four sides? Yes, it does. You can count them up, one, two, three, four, right? Are the sides straight? Yes, the sides are straight. So we've already met two of our criteria. Is this figure closed, right? If you can, yeah, you all can see pretty clearly there. The figure is closed, all right? It has four vertices, right? And well, I won't give you the angles, the internal angles for this figure, but they would sum to 360 degrees, right? All these four angles together it would sum to 360 degrees. So four-sided figure, closed, the sides are closed, four vertices, angle summing to 360 degrees. That's a quadrilateral, and this one is irregular because it does not fit a particular mold, and we are going to learn about these particular types of quadrilaterals now, all right? So there are special types of quadrilaterals, which we all should be familiar, of, familiar with. Some of them are already well known to us. I mean, perhaps we're going to be learning a couple more today, if you didn't already know. So the two that should immediately jump out to you are the rectangle and the square. I think pretty much everyone from a very young age would have been exposed to what a rectangle is and to what a square is, all right? Both of these are actually cousins of, or, or sub-members of the bigger groups of parallelogram. The bigger group of parallelogram. A parallelogram is a quadrilateral wherein the opposite sides are parallel. 
In other words, they are pointing this in the same direction and they won't ever meet. That is the opposite sides, okay? Clearly these, these two sides meet here, but this side and this side won't ever meet, nor would this side and this side ever meet, all right? That is our parallelogram. Does that apply to our rectangle and our square? Yes, it does. In our rectangle, right, both of these sides will never meet, and they are parallel to each other, right? Both of these sides will never meet, okay? They are also parallel to each other, all right? And the opposite sides are equal in length. That's also true of the parallelogram. The opposite sides are equal in length and parallel. However, in the rectangle, all the angles within, all the four angles are exactly 90 degrees, all right? So if we kind of take this parallelogram and we straighten them up a bit, we're gonna end up with that rectangle, okay? Now the square is a special case of the rectangle or another special case of the parallelogram where all the angles are also equal to 90 degrees, all right? So it, but before that, the opposite sides are parallel. So that already tells us that it's a parallelogram. Good. The opposite sides are parallel, so that makes it a parallelogram. The opposite sides are equal in length. This side is equal to this side in length. This side is equal to this side in length. All the angles inside are 90 degrees. Each angle is 90 degrees. So that also makes it a rectangle. But what makes it a square? is that in addition to this side being equal to this side, we, we know that this side and this side are equal, but they are all equal. All the four sides have the same length. So all angles are 90 degrees and all sides are equal, which pretty much makes it a rectangle with the exception that it's not just the opposite sides that are equal, but in fact, all of the sides are equal. All right, we also have a rhombus. I know that this might be a lot of information, but you need to know this in order to really answer the question without guessing, all right? We are trying not to make you guess. We are trying to have you have some certainty when you're answering these questions about lines of symmetry and quadrilateral and so on, right? So a rhombus, we have all sides equal, just like the square. However, the angles are not 90 degrees, right? The opposite sides are parallel, meaning that they don't meet, right? The opposite sides are also equal. Further to that, all the sides are equal, just like the square, right? But these angles inside here, they are not 90 degrees, all right? They are not all 90 degrees, so that tells us that we have on the board a rhombus, okay? We also have the trapezium, which we say here in Trinidad and Tobago because we had adopted the British English a long time ago. In the United States, they would say trapezoid. All right, it means the same thing. Two of the sides, only two of the sides are parallel. All right, that is our trapezium. And then in the, in the kite, all right, two of the sides, two of the sides, opposite sides, sorry, are parallel. And in the kite, the adjacent sides, meaning the sides next to each other, are equal in length. So this one is equal to this one. Adjacent means next to each other, right? And this one is equal to this one because these are the adjacent sides on this end. All right? So these are six types of quadrilaterals. Did you know that? I would imagine some of us did not know all of these. So now you know, all right? We have the rectangle, the square, the rhombus, the parallelogram, the trapezium, and the kite. It is not a fully exhaustive list. There are some others, but these are the most common ones. There's a special case of the trapezium that is in our question that we are looking at right now, and we're going to get to that, all right? So, if I've lost anyone there at the end of this program, please 
look at it, rewatch it, watch it as many times as you need to, get your textbook, use the Google, whatever resources you have to help concretize your understanding, all right? And we are doing our best to give you it here live on live television, so we can't repeat it over and over. But I hope that that was clear to the majority of you. And for those who didn't quite get it as yet, remember to rewatch the videos, okay? So that's a quadrilateral, a four-sided, plain figure, straight sides, closed, all the angles together, summed to 360 degrees. That's what we need to understand to answer our, our question. We also need to understand what is a line of symmetry. So a line of symmetry is an imaginary line. Now th this is a definition and one that our SEA students would understand quite clearly. It's an imaginary line where you can fold a shape and have both halves match exactly, okay? So if you have a square piece of paper, you fold it in half. When you fold it, you can't see anything poking out of either edge once you fold it correctly at the halfway line, whether vertically, horizontally, or along both diagonals, as we're going to see now. Once it's folded such that one half completely covers the other half, that line about which you fold it is called a line of symmetry. Some quadrilaterals have lines of symmetry. Some have more than one, some have one, some have none. So our understanding of this is going to help us to answer the question, which of those quadrilaterals presented has one line of symmetry? That was what the question specified, one line of symmetry, okay? So let's just look at some of the quadrilaterals that we would have just discussed. And I want you all, you can basically learn these off. You can pause it, you can take a screenshot, you can watch it, you can copy it back onto your notes parents, all right? We have the square has four lines of symmetry. Four lines of symmetry. Four ways in which we can fold it and end up with the sides equally matching. All right, the rectangle does not have the diagonal lines of symmetry. If you get a rectangular piece of paper and you try to fold it diagonally, you will recognize that one piece is going to jut out over there like that, right? So it's not going to be a line of symmetry. So we just have the two. We can fold it horizontally or vertically. Right, the irregular quadrilateral that we discussed before I started giving you the special quadrilaterals that we need to know. This has no line of symmetry. If you look at it and try to imagine any way to fold this to get one half to cover the other half, it's not going to, all right? You can even make one with Bristol board at home, make sure your lines are straight and so on, and see if you can get an irregular quadrilateral to fold symmetrically, and you won't be able to. Can I assure you of that? We have the kite, which just has one line of symmetry, right? We have just one line of symmetry, and we have the rhombus, all right, which is like the square, all equal sides, opposite sides parallel, but the angles inside are not all 90 degrees. This also has two lines of symmetry. Now that we have said all of this, I think that I have armed you with enough information to come up with an answer. So please, the lines are open. If you can tell me which of these quadrilaterals below has only one line of symmetry, not two, not three, not four, not zero, but one line of symmetry, please call and let us know which of these quadrilaterals you think it is. All right, if you can't name it off the top of your head, I will just label them. One, two, three, and four. And I do have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hi. Um, the Hello, good evening. Who am I speaking with? Um, I'm, you're speaking with Nicholas. The, the one line of symmetry is the trapezium. Right. Which one? Number three or number four? Number three. All right. Excellent. Well done, sir. Well done, young man. That is very correct. All right, now here's what class. We have two trapeziums here, all right? If we go back to all 
Right, we had this trapezium, okay, with these two sides parallel, right? And then we had two non-parallel sides, right, which are the remaining two. But if you look at them, you'll realize that they are not equal in length. One is shorter than the other, right? That is a general type of trapezium. But in our question here, right, do we have two parallel sides in, in trapezium number three? Yes, we have two parallel sides. Right, do we have two parallel sides in trapezium number four? Yes, we do. We have one and we have two. Now, granted, we have to do a little bit of assumption here by using our, 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 our naked eye, right? These two sides here appear to be equal in length, all right? Whereas these two sides here do not appear to be equal in length. So this type of trapezium has zero lines of symmetry, but this particular type of trapezium here, which we call the isosceles trapezium, does have one line of symmetry because these two sides are equal in length. So we can fold it along that line of symmetry and have one side cover the other side. So the answer, which of the quadrilaterals? It is the isosceles trapezium. Now I don't know if you had just put trapezium, if the examiner would have given it to you because there are really two trapeziums in this question, okay? So that is the answer to this question, all right? So once again, we have our rhombus with two lines of symmetry. We have our general parallelogram, no lines of symmetry. We have the isosceles trapezium with the one line of symmetry. And we have just the regular trapezium with no lines of symmetry. And those are the four figures that we had in this question, okay? We had a rhombus, we had a isosceles trapezium, we had a parallelogram, and we had just a regular trapezium. All right, guess what? Plain shapes are the only things that can have lines of symmetry, right? Even letters might have lines of symmetry. Can we fold a letter in a certain way to get one half of it to completely cover the other? The answer is yes, all right? So looking at these four letters on the screen, and this will be our final call for tonight, by understanding that it must be folded in a way that one half covers the other half, which of these four letters has no line of symmetry? Hello, good evening, and welcome to IBN. Good evening, Kuala. Good evening. Who am I speaking with? Juliana St. Okay, welcome to our program. Can you tell me which letter has no line of symmetry? Yes, the answer is S. Very good. The answer is yes. Thank you so much for that answer, Juliana. You are quite correct. Okay, so the letter H can be folded in this way, can be folded in that way. All right. The letter T, we just have the one line of symmetry, right? The letter W, we also have just the one line of symmetry, but we have no line of symmetry for S. If we try to fold it, right, we're gonna end up with something like this. So this piece would not cover the underneath piece, all right? And clearly we can't fold it this way either to get one half to cover the other half. And that is how we know that the letter S has no lines of symmetry and that young boys and girls, exam candidates has been our program for today. Remember to log on to Edmodo and check over the weekend. I believe you and your parents might get notifications in your email when the assignments are posted and do them. You'll have all the way until next week Thursday at 4.59 p.m. again um, to complete them. Okay, look out for math and ELA and a creative writing. This has been your math teacher, Sir Ijaz Ramsahai, and 
You've been watching C Results on IBN TV. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for the calls. And I'll see you on Monday, God willing. Salam alaikum. Good evening. My brothers and sisters, when I was given this topic,